Good afternoon, my name is John Mogul and I'm Associate Director here at the Wolfsonian Florida International University. I want to welcome you to this afternoon's talk and to um, Art Deco Weekend 2020. Uh, we are delighted once again to be partnering with the Miami Design Preservation League on this series of talks um, at the Wolfsonian. We had a, a, um, four uh, wonderful presentations yesterday and also this morning. We have one more at 3 o'clock this afternoon. Um, and thank you all very much for coming. Uh, I want to mention that you are all welcome to visit our galleries after this talk on the seventh floor. Um, very appropriately, we have an exhibition called Deco from Luxury to, Ma to Mass Market, which is about the development of the Art Deco style in Europe and its translation and adaptation here in the United States. Uh, we also have an exhibition marking the 80th birthday of our founder, Mitchell Wolfson Jr., on the sixth floor. It's called A Universe of Things, and our permanent collection galleries, and a small exhibition about the Cuban illustrator and graphic designer, Colorado Walter Massaguer, on the fifth floor. So there's a lot to see, and if you have time and you're interested, please just go to the box office after this talk. Let them know that you were here for the talk, and they'll give you a sticker, and you can go right upstairs. Um, so we will get started this morning, and Joe Manning, a board member at Miami Design Preservation League, is going to introduce our speaker, Dr. Lynette Long. Thanks very much. It's a pleasure and an honor to introduce Lynette, who's become a friend. And she is responsible for that wonderful Shiro's exhibit at the MDPL that everyone is talking about. Woo! Yes. <laughs> exactly. Um, Lynette is the only person I know who's been profiled on Wikipedia. And if you want to know everything, well, most everything, on, on Lynette, just look up that article because it's very informative. Um, Lynette and I share um, a couple of, couple three similarities, very shallow ones, but uh, we share the same ethnicity. We were both born in New York City. We're both, we both have daughters and grandchildren living in London, very international. Um, alas, she has three degrees. I don't, <laughs> and, and she's written 30 books. I've only written five, so that's it. That's the end of that, but let me talk about her. This, this is such an important year for all of us, men as well as women. In 1920, women got the right to vote, the 19th Amendment. This year, we were supposed to get on the $20 bill the Face of Harriet Tubman, and by the way, if you haven't seen that film about Harriet Tubman, I do recommend it, it's, it's wonderfully done. And somehow, um, even though it was passed during the Obama administration, the current administration and the Secretary of the Treasury has denied this. Uh, there's some very bogus reasons for it, but I found out this morning that you can go online at Etsy and get a stamp. A stamp of the face of Harriet Tubman. And you can stamp Andrew Jackson. This is really cool. Whether this invalidates a $20 bill, I don't know. I think it's, it's a gesture in the right direction. 
Lynette has been uh, a trailblazer in math education, child psychology. She and her husband coined the term latchkey children, which I think we have all used from time to time. And she is involved in such an important project right now. It's equal visibility everywhere, where she is going and trying to convince municipalities and states and other governments to consider women as subjects for statues and historical markers and stamps and currency. And she has been successful. Uh, it was a long struggle, but you know, we got all involved with these Civil War general statues. But how about some of the women? I mean, really? You know, this, this is a shame. We need strong role models for our girls and for our boys. And this is important. So please support Lynette in this. And please support the MDPL. Only costs $25 to join. This has been a wonderful Art Deco weekend, and we hope to see many more. And now, it's with great pleasure, I introduce Lynette Long. showing up on a Sunday afternoon. I'm excited to be here and I'm excited to talk about women's suffrage. And it's a 72 year battle and you're gonna learn a little about it right now. Uh, so 1776, the Declaration of Independence. Let's just start with that. We hold these truths to be self-evident. All men are created equal. And they meant it literally. <laughs> they meant white men are created equal. So I want to start with that, because sometimes we say men when we mean men and women, but in 1776, they meant men. So we can proceed now to the Constitution. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, the Constitution was written and framed by 55 men representing the 13 colonies. We are not the people. I'm just going to be clear about that. As a woman, we are not the people. And you're going to see why I say that in a minute. Thomas Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence. Interesting to me that he was married for three years to the love of his life. OK. Women at the time were the property of their father or husband. And these two women, in 1848, held the first women's right conference in the world, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia Mott. Now, one of them was a great writer, and one of them was a great orator. And the orator is on your right. So Lucretia Mott was the orator. But Elizabeth Cady Stanton at the time wrote, we are assembled to protest against a form of government existing without consent of the governed to declare our right to be as free as a man, to be represented in a government in which we are taxed to support, to have disgraceful laws, to give a man a power to chastise or imprison his wife, to take wages that she earns, the property which she inherits, and to take her children in case of divorce. So they could take your kids, your money, your property. You had no rights. And that was 1848. They had the first women's right convention in Seneca Falls. And they wrote a declaration of sentiments, which was modeled after the Declaration of Independence. And of course, Elizabeth Cady Stan wrote, we hold these truths to be self-evident all men and women are created equal. And that's how it started. And there are about 200 people in attendance. Now, we move forward. And I'm going to tell you that in 1851, Elizabeth Cady Stanton meets Susan B. Anthony. And we hear a lot about Susan B. Anthony and the quest for the right to vote. And she's on the dollar bill. But by the end of this talk, you'll know who my hero is. It's not Susan B. Anthony. So we form different groups to try to get the vote. And one group 
wanted to go state by state. Let's try to get one state, let's try to get another state, and that was the American Women's Suffrage Association. But then there was the National Women's Suffrage Association, they said, let's get a constitutional amendment. So these two groups were trying different strategies. They formed in 1869, and in 1869, we had our first state give women the right to vote in every election. Guess what? Wyoming. <laughs> Wyoming get women the right to vote. Now, in 1870, the 15th Amendment passed. And um, the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or bridged by the United States or any state on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. All right? Giving African-American men the right to vote. We are not citizens. The right of all citizens. We are not considered citizens. That I just want to make that clear. Okay, so there are the two groups. There's, I forgot about the slides. There's Wyoming. And when this started and Wyoming passed, then guess what? Oppositional groups set up to be against suffrage. And here we go. They put out lots of posters demeaning women, scaring men, saying you're going to lose. You're the feminine of women is at stake. You're going to be doing all the chores. Your wife isn't going to be available to you. Do not vote for suffrage. Susan B. Anthony goes in 1872 and decides she wants to vote. Guess what? She's arrested. It's fine, and she's not paying any fine. But she was arrested. Mm -hmm because they tried to vote in an election. And people in Florida tried to vote at different times. Now, Victoria Woodall, this is interesting, she is credited with being the first woman to run for president. And she did, 1872. You know what's interesting about it? She would have only been 34 on the day of the inauguration. In order to be president, you have to be a natural born citizen and 35 years old. But no one says anything about that. They say, ah, oh, she's the first woman to run for president. So enter Carrie Chapman's cat. She decides they're going to merge these two groups, the ones that want to go by state and the ones that want to go by the amendment and try to work on this. All right? And they call it, they merge the names, National American Women's Suffrage. And then here they are trying to get suffrage. Now, how did they try? Mostly they wrote, these were educated women, or they gave speeches, and just like they did for the temperance movement. They, a lot of speeches and a lot of writing. Alice Paul comes in 1910 to the States, and um, I don't, this is about how the women, the states that gave the vote after that, six states. Somehow the slide for Ida B. Wells is missing. Ida B. Wells was an African American who started the Alpha Suffrage Club. And that was a club to get African Americans engaged in the suffrage movement. And she also became very famous for anti-lynching and writing. She was a very famous person. So you can see the states in order. Do we notice something? The West. New York was not next, by the way. OK. Oh, there's Ida B. Wells. So she started the suffrage, Alpha Suffrage Club. Woodrow Wilson, now here's where the fun starts. Woodrow Wilson is inaugurated March 4th, 1913. Alice Paul my hero, at 28 years old, comes over, and she had joined this uh, Carrie Chapman cat and said, this is going too slow. We got to do something about this. This is ridiculous. This is now 50 years they've been fighting for suffrage and getting nowhere. So she wants to do a more radical approach. My, so what does she do? 
She says Woodrow Wilson is going to be inaugurated on March 4th, 1913. We're going to have a parade on March 3rd, 1914, right down Pennsylvania Avenue, a girl after my own heart. <laughs> Just 5,000 people marching. She has Inelis Milholland on Grey Dawn leading the parade, who's a lawyer and a Vassar graduate, by the way. She, and I'm jumping ahead, died a few years later, never saw the right to vote, while she was speaking in LA. She was so committed to the cause, she had pernicious anemia, and they said, you need to stop and get treated. She died speaking in favor of suffrage. Wow. Okay, here's a picture of the parade. I love this picture. Now, Alice Paul decided, if guys are afraid we're going to be too masculine, we should change to white. It shows up against black. How innocent we look and sweet. So they rebranded the movement to wear white. And they thought, well, everybody has white anyway. Someone has white shirt, white clothes. So this is the suffrage parade. They had um, horseback units, many of them. As I said, 5,000 marchers. They had floats. They put on plays. They had representation from countries that gave suffrage to women already. This was a huge parade. Helen Keller was in the parade. Here's the problem with the parade. They had 500,000 people attend New in Washington, D.C. You're talking in 1913, 500,000 police barricades. The people who watching the parade, a lot of them were anti-suffrage. There wasn't enough police. They pushed over the barricades, harassed the people in the parade. They couldn't even march. They had to fight their way to march forward, literally. And hundreds were in the hospital, and the government called in the cavalry to try to, and it was all over the newspapers how horrible this parade turned out. There's Alice Paul, and she's with a group of women because she says, I've had enough of the National American Women's Suffrage Association. I'm starting the National Women's Party. We're a little bit more radical and young. Now, when she started this, she was 28 years old. This poor woman, poor woman, she had a PhD from University of Pennsylvania, a master's from Columbia, and was a very well-educated woman. Her sidekick, Lucy Burns, was with her, also very well-educated. They both were in London and helping with the British suffrage movement, and that's where they learned a lot of their techniques. Where the US movement was more conservative, the British was more radical. So they said, we're going to do what the British do. But I want to tell you, we got the right to vote before the Brits. Because the Brits in 1918 gave the right to vote if you were married, over 30, and a property owner. Wow. So there were some conditions. We gave the right to vote in 1920. So, Alice Paul, remember I said she's good at branding, decides to make a flag, the suffrage flag. There it is. Purple, loyalty, white, purity, gold, hope. And this becomes the flag of the suffrage movement. Purple, white, gold. Now, so her technique's much more radical. And they started having these parades, like the one you saw in Washington, D.C., all over the country. For four years, his whole first term, they're protesting. They're protesting on the street, as you can see. They're having parades everywhere. They're having speeches everywhere. And they are organized. Alice Paul, she's not playing around. She wants to get the right to vote. Well, it comes 1917, here they're going door to door, always wearing suffrage white, carrying signs, and expressing their feelings. So, it comes 1917, and Wilson is elected again, and we haven't made much progress. 
Alice Paul's like, we gotta step it up. And they're like, what are you gonna do now? She's like, she got a thousand women to volunteer, 1,000, and they stood in front of the White House, first act of civil disobedience like this, six days a week, year round. Six days a week. The onlookers didn't like it. Remember how I said they didn't like the parade? Well, they certainly didn't like people standing in front of the White House. They threw things, they cursed at them. Now, imagine this, having giving women the right to vote is a radical idea. Why? We're 51% of the population. That's give, why. That's <laughs> why we're the power. I mean, sure, I'll give you a right to vote, but to give a group larger than yourself the right to vote is a very radical and scary idea because you don't know what happened. What if all these women band together and voted for one thing? I'd have absolutely no power. I'd be impotent. So, the silent sentinels, here they are, standing in front of the White House, and that's from the National Archives. April 6th, U.S. enters World War I. Now, um, now, you do not, you do not protest a president at war. And this was not a little conflict. This was World War I. You are not going to be disrespectful to the president and to our country in a time of the war. So it was a big controversy. What do you think Alex Spall said? Here we are. Too bad. So what does her sign say? President Wilson is deceiving the world when he appears to be the as the proponent of democracy president wilson has opposed those who demand democracy in this country um so these silent sentinels stood out there there's the flag every day while the u.s is at war kaiser wilson all right so as you can suspect the white house didn't like it Correct? So, and the hecklers were heckling the women, attacking them, throwing things at them. It got very physical. 20 million women could not vote. So what happens? They start to arrest them. What did they do wrong? Blocking pedestrian traffic. <laughs> And they find them for blocking pedestrian traffic. And so they arrest the women and they send them to Occoquan Prison in Virginia. Um, there's Lucy Burns, Alice Paul's sidekick at Occoquan. And they fed them food full of maggots. They had nights of terror where they chained their hands on the bars above. And Alice Paul was so outraged, she started a hunger strike in the prison. And they had used hunger strikes in England also. So what happens when you have a hunger strike? And outside, women were protesting, trying to get these women free because they said they did nothing wrong. These are really political prisoners. But um, they were fined $10 for obstructing tr pedestrian traffic, and they refused to pay. They said, we're not paying, so they went to jail. Well, the hunger strike, uh, uh, charged up Alice Paul's supporters, but hundreds of women were imprisoned. It's not just her, but as the leader of the National Women's Party and the most radical. Remember, she started this at 28 years old, so if young women think you can accomplish something. Meanwhile, the older suffragettes are like, wow, what is she doing? This is so radical. Um, people were fighting for her. What did they do to the suffragettes or the suffragists? They force fed them. They stuck tubes down their throat, raw eggs three times a day. They were beaten, they were tortured, and there they were. Well, somehow word got out to a newspaper reporter. Someone visited something, some a note was slipped in a pocket, 
how, exactly how, I'm not sure, but guess what? Public sentiment changed. That these women were willing to go to jail, be tortured, and be imprisoned for us to vote. So Wilson now had to get on the side of the suffrage movement. And on June 14, the suffrage movement passed Congress, 1919. So we had both houses, and these are the states that ratified it in the order. We had to have 36 states. These are the first 35. Illinois led the way. And so, uh, no, Florida's not on there. <laughs> I don't even want to go into Florida, but it's not on there. So, we come to Kansas. Everybody descends on Kansas and say, wow, maybe we can make Kansas number 36. Maybe. So the idea at the time was, if you were anti-suffrage, you wore a red rose. And if you were for suffrage, you wore a yellow rose. So they come into the state house and everybody's wearing red roses or yellow roses. And they know how everybody's going to vote. Well, the vote is tied. And there's your roses, yellow and red. And this young member of the Tennessee Assembly, the youngest member, everybody else they said is over 60, is the tie-breaking vote. And everybody thinks he's anti-suffrage. And so we got a tie vote, everybody's sitting there, the gallery's full, and there comes up little Harry Byrne. But no one knows that in his letter, he, in his pocket, he has a letter from his mother, <laughs> his widowed mother, who says, Harry, come on, support Mrs. Cat, because now it's Carrie Chapman Cat, support her, and put the rat in ratification. Put the rat in ratification. So, when it comes to his little turn to vote at the end, he says, I, and puts on this yellow rose, and people were so scared for him, they escorted him out of the back door because he was the deciding vote, and the 19th Amendment was passed, and women now had the right to vote. Now, here's Alice Paul, and if you look at the stars on the flag, there's our suffrage flag. But every time a state ratified the amendment, she sewed on a flag. So this flag with all 36 stars is called the victory flag because this shows that we were victorious in getting suffrage. And I'll continue, but you can see why Alice Paul's my hero, because she put her life on the line. She organized a parade of 5,000 marchers in three months and had groups from all over the world come. It was an amazing feat. She was courageous. She knew they were going to force feed her. They had done it in England, and she still staged the suffrage, the um, hunger strike. She was courageous, and people followed her. So the 19th Amendment passed, and the right of citizens, interesting, they used that word citizens again, but now we're included. We are citizens of the United States to vote, shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or any state on account of sex. So that gave women the right to vote. The story does not end here, ladies and gentlemen, because the women were so excited, and Alice Paul was so excited, that they decided to commission a statue in honor of suffrage, that we got this right to vote. And they hired a sculptor, Adelaide Johnson, and she did it. And this is a picture of the unveiling, and they did it on Susan B. Anthony's birthday, 100th, 100th birthday, September 10th, 101st birthday, 1921. So this is. And this is the statue up close. Now, in the back is Susan B. Anthony. In the front is the person I told you was a great orator, Lucretia Mott. 
And on the left, the person wrote the original Declaration of Sentiments. We hold these truths to be self-evident. All men and women are created equal, Kara Chapman Cat. And in the back, there's a block of marble uncarved, and there's a big dispute. Is that the first woman president? Mm -hmm. Is that all the suffragettes who didn't um, get their face on the sculpture? What does that represent? So the sculpture, and I always write down a couple quotes if I have it, had something written on the back in gold lettering. She didn't have a chance to carve it, so she wrote in gold the sculptor. Um, men and their rights and nothing more. Women their rights and nothing less. Sounds pretty simple. Women first denied a soul, then called mindless, now arisen, declared herself an entity to be reckoned. The US government thought it was too radical, so they took that off. So that is no longer on the sculpture. The men, remember at this point, the Congress I believe is 100% men, or you might have, I don't know what year Jeanette Rankin was elected, our first woman member of Congress, but they said, this looks like three women in a bathtub. <laughs> These women are ugly. We don't want this sculpture. It's right in the rotunda, right when you walk in the rotunda. The next day, they put it in the basement, oh. in a broom closet, in the Capitol crypt. Yes. We were nice. So let me finish with the sculpture. So it stayed there. People went down and dusted it off. People took care of it. And they kept saying, let me, let's get it up. Let's get it up. And finally, in 1995 or 1997, um, Carolyn, yeah, 1997, John Wages, who started the movement, and Carolyn Mahone, Mahone, Maloney from New York sponsored a bill and said, we're bringing it up. So the government says, that's great. It costs $75,000 to move it up. They're like, but we didn't move it down. <laughs> well, we don't care. Can you use congressional funds or the architect's fund? Newt Grindrich said, absolutely not. So they raised the money to bring the statue up, and it went back to the rotunda in 1997. Wow. Now, the women who started it, Joan Wages, who I know, she is the person who started the National Women's History Museum to be part of the Smithsonian collection. And the group of women she worked with to raise the 75,000 are the women who started that effort to have a women's history museum. Now, I love the Capitol Rotunda. It's one of my least favorite places because we have a freeze at the top, and I don't have a picture, sorry, that goes around the whole top that depicts our total history from the first landing to the Wright brothers. And we have one figure, Pocahontas. That's the only woman on the whole freeze, and she's become like, a cartoon character. I know she's a real person, but we get Pocahontas. Everybody else is up there in this beautiful freeze. But do not despair because they have eight giant, giant paintings in the rotunda. I mean like 12 by 18 giant paintings. Gorgeous. We get Pocahontas on her knees before God and man. That's it. So I think the capital is a little biased. And um, I got involved in this, and I'm gonna go a little further in a minute, because I took a tour of the capital, and I've been to the capital many times, but I don't know why this day I was especially jazzed, or as usual. <laughs> but I took a tour, and every state gets two statues. Two, and only two. So there are 100 statues in the capital. I'm taking the tour and this guide's taking me around and I said, how many statues of women? Because I'm noticing something's wrong here. And she proudly said, 
nine, we just got Helen Keller from Alabama. And I'm like, nine? Out of 100? 9%? We're 51% of the population. Nine? I'm going to change that. And she said, these statues are 10 feet tall. And they've been here 100 years. I said, okay, you'll see. So that started me on this quest. Um, and my first attempt at getting a statue, naive that I was, was I was in New York and I opened a newspaper and it said, Ohio is going to change one of its statues in Statue Hall. Really? And they said, here are 10 candidates. And guess what? Out of the 10, not one woman. Not one woman out of the 10. So I called up Ohio, the state legislature, and the state legislature controls the statute not the U.S. Ca ca um, Congress, called up and I said, what's going on here? They said, well, they have 90, 90 people, Lynette. But no, I can't believe this. I thought you didn't even put a woman. So the woman said, well, why don't you nominate some people? I said, okay, I'll tell you. You should know they have to be from Ohio. You can't nominate. You're not living in Ohio. I said, okay, don't worry about it. So I found the uh, Harry Beecher Stowe houses in Ohio. Harry Beecher Stowe run, wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin based on her experience in Ohio of people crossing the river from Kentucky. So we nominated Harry Beecher Stowe. I thought what a great candidate. I then contacted Ohio Pistol and Gun. And we nominated Annie Oakley. Yeah. <laughs> One of my favorites. I love Annie Oakley because most people don't know she was an indentured servant. Oh, wow. And when her father died, her mother put her out as a servant. And she was beaten and raped and could never have children. And her whole life, she gave all her money and melted all her medals and gave the money to widows and orphans. So she touched my heart, Annie Oakley. And I thought, wow, wouldn't it be cool for girls to see someone in the cabin? Well, I go to Ohio. Yes, I pay myself. I go to Ohio and I go to testify. And what do I see? Hundreds of people, banners. So I'm like, where am I? I did not expect it to be a big deal. There was the Wright brothers, their niece. There was eight presidents from Ohio. There was Jesse Owens and all of Ohio State University. There was Salk, Jonas Salk, who developed the polio vaccine. There was Thomas Edison, the light bulb. I was like, uh, this is a little competition here. Well, Thomas Edison elected, I mean, Ohio elected to pick Thomas Edison. And I continually she wrote them and say he electrocuted an elephant. Daisy, don't do it, but they did anyway. So anyway, that was my first quest at a statue. It didn't work, but I'm just trying to show you how hard it is. So let's get back to suffrage. Mary McLeod Bethune, who started Bethune Cookman College and started at a girls' school, she is going in National Statuary Hall from Florida. Yay. And she is replacing General Edward Kirby Smith. Confederate General Edward Kirby Smith, but it was a battle and uh, um, Florida decided to re replace General Smith with the idea that we need to rebrand Florida. No one knows who he is. And let's get some famous people. And the Commission for Women for the whole state of Florida narrowed it down to three people. Mary McLeod Bethune, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, and the founder of Publix. Well, when I saw that, I knew we were in. <laughs> they were going to put the founder of Publix, and I was like so glad they didn't nominate Disney, Flagler. <laughs> there are a lot of important men from Florida, so Mary McLeod Bethune will probably go in this year. And Amelia Earhart is also going in from Kansas, and I did fly to Kansas and work on that and got that through. So um, Mary McLeod Bethune, she raised money because there were poll taxes, and she taught people to read. So she wanted to encourage African Americans to vote. Mary Cap Carrie Chapman Chat, sorry, she went on to found League of Women Voters. Another unbelievable accomplishment. 
And Alice Paul wrote the Equal Rights Amendment. So these three women, one started a college, a university, one wrote the Equal Rights Amendment, and one founded the League of Women Voters, all coming out of the suffrage movement. So it took 72 years for us to get suffrage. I put these women as a wall of honor. Why? Because none of them ever had the right to vote. And they all accomplished amazing things. And it touches my heart to be, as I tried to explain at the beginning, to not be even considered a citizen, a person, to be in a position where your husband can take your children, your property, you can't inherit, you can't vote, can be beaten, your wages, you have no right to anything, and to accomplish amazing things. I have to say they give me courage. And one of my other heroes, besides Alice Paul, is Florida's own Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, because up to 108, she still kept speaking on behalf of the environment, and when people booed, she said, can't you boo any louder? And she never stopped, you know? And she said, the Everglades is women's issues because it's the environment, it's like housekeeping. So I love these women, and they're an inspiration to me, and I want us all to keep fighting. Thank you. Sacagawea led the Lewis and Clark expedition out west. She was a Shoshone guy. Yes. She was on the dollar coin. They first made it Susan B. Anthony, and then they took it out of circulation because it looked too much like a quarter and people didn't like it. So then they made it Sacagawea, or Sacagawea, there's, um, and they made it gold. But it's really not in circulation either, but they still mint it for collectors. Other questions? So there are no women on our paper currency, but not all of the people on the currency are presidents. We've, we've mint the one, the two, the five, the 10, the 20, and the 100. And two of them are not presidents. Yes, ma'am. How can we help you in your work? Uh, well, Tuesday, Laura and I, who's Laura's here, is the head of the Commission for Women. We're going over to Hialeah. We are unveiling a marker for Amelia Earhart. Very few people know she took her final flight, started in Miami from Miami Municipal Airport. And the city of Hialeah is going to put up the marker and it's paid for by the Hialeah Women's Club, Greater Federation of Women's Clubs. And so one of the easiest ways to help, and I'll tell you a little bit about the markers, and Laura and I are working on a marker for Julia Tuttle and Mary Perkle across the way. And we unveiled Elizabeth Walt Simmons on the grounds of a camp hall in Coconut Grove last year. She was the first woman doctor in Miami. And the building that was her office, I'm talking, she was there in the mid-1890s, when I was still a pioneer town. The building still stands, her office still stands on the grounds of the camp hall. We unveiled a historical marker for, for her last, last December. Yeah, so, but, uh, one second. So, I, um, I'm a counter. I have a master's in math. And one day I was bored. And what I do to relax, some people go take a jacuzzi or a massage. I count. So I said, let me count how many markers are in Florida. Well, Tallahassee approves the marker and they're all online. And I counted. That's by county. You can go look it up. And I counted. And I'm like, wow, there are 950 of these giant historical markers in Florida on a pole, 950. Six of women. Six. So I said, we have to do something about that. So I called the head of the historical markers, Michael Hart. We're good friends now. And I said, Michael, there's a problem. How can we only have six of them? Yeah, then, then I know it's serious. I'm like, Michael, you're not paying attention. We need to do something now. Yeah, nah, nah. 
So I said, okay, I wrote an op-ed for the Tallahassee Democrat when the session was in, Tallahassee was a session. Guess what? Guess who called me? Not Michael Hart, the head of historic preservation for the whole state of Florida. For everything, not just markers, building. Lynette, we have a problem. Really? We saw your article. Really? So since that time, I've been applying for markers. And once in Miami, Laura's been helping me with, but I put up Marjorie Stoneman Douglas. That Marjorie, yeah, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas got a marker. Um, and Friends of the Everglades sponsored it. And then um, Betty Mae Tiger Jumper, first female chief of the Seminoles in, in Indian Town. Um, Marjorie Kim Rawlings, author of The Yearling. So I keep applying. Judy Drucker. What? Judy Drucker. And Judy Drucker got a marker. Barbara Kaepernick. Right? And Barbara Kaepernick, I applied for that marker. Right. So a, a bunch of markers. I'm applying all over Florida to try to get markers, and maybe we'll get a grant moved to other states. But the markers are important. I think things that are visual are very important. Yes, ma'am. Well, I was just reading in the Hill this morning that the fight between Bernie and Elizabeth Warren is dividing the Democratic Party, and it's over women, whether a woman could become a president. He says that he didn't ever say that a woman couldn't become a president. So the fight continues today, even about, and you know, with Hillary four years ago, and like, the, did she lose because she was a woman? So it's still very present. Right. Well, I try to stay out of politics because I have to get help from Republican members of the legislature. Like, I want to go to Georgia, and who started the Girl Scouts? Julia Gordon Lowe, and get a statue of her in the U.S. Capitol. So I try to, that's a Republican state. You have to have support from legislators from all sides of the aisle, and um, so I try to stay out of that. Uh -huh. One last question, yes ma'am? There were a few times during the talk that you referred to Alice Paul's well, sidekick. I can't. You know, there were a few times during the talk that you referred to Alice Paul's sidekick, and I'm wondering what the nature of the relationship was. Was that her lover? I don't know. Uh -huh. I would love to get Alice Paul in the U.S. Capitol, though. I think uh -huh. she's underappreciated. And if you want to see her story, the movie with Hilary Swank, Iron Jawed Angels, tells the story, and it's a very powerful movie. But I. Say the name of it again. Iron Jawed Angels, and it tells the whole story of the suffrage movement as Alice Paul came to it. Not remember, this is a 72 year battle for suffrage, mm -hmm. and here we are. And in the first election, 1920, only 36 percent of women voted, only 36 percent. But the number has increased as we've gone on, and also women hold different political views than men on marijuana, men are more pro. On gun control, women are more pro. Yes, ma'am. Uh, what percentage of women vote today compared to back then, the 36%? About? I think about 60 in the last election. 60% of women uh, vote. Four more million, three or four more million women voted than men in the last presidential election. Us to be, women, us to be included as more in the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. But I can't answer to that. I want to say a one other battle I fought, and I'm really going to end with this, is Google Doodles. You know Google Doodles? The little doodle on top of Google? You know, I like to go after high visibility things. Three billion hits a day. Do you hear that? Three billion hits a day. People see that little doodle that's up for 24 hours. So from 1998, when Google first started, it's hard to believe that it started in 1998, one day I was born again. So I counted all the doodles, and I wanted to look for how many they put up globally, because some are regionally and some are globally, about women. From 1998 to 1910, 1910 was the day I was, 1910 was the day I was born, uh, one, one. Mary Kassat. So I promise you they heard from me. So thank you very much.